Sri Vishnu Sahasranam, name 952, Pushpahasa. This is a real sweet name. He who is like the bloom of a flower or has a smile like a flower. It's easy to understand. Pushpa is a very common word, which means flower, and hasa means smile or laughter. This reminds us of the name Swasya, which means who has a beautiful face, name 848. And there are many similar names, Ruchi Rangada, who gives the beauty of his form, the, the attractiveness, the tastefulness of his form. Uh, we had that recently. Pushpa, this name, this this word, which is means a flower, comes from the idea of vikas, to open, to blossom, to develop, and has gives the idea of not only to smile, but to excel or to bloom. So the various interpretations, they mostly dwell on the tenderness and the pleasing nature of Bhagavan, particularly toward his devotees, because he's not pleasing to everyone. Parasha Bhatta explains this name to mean that for those, the devotees, who are so fortunate, who are blessed with the tendency to appreciate him. For them, he manifests his enjoyable nature, his, his gentle, tender nature like a flower that blossoms in the evening. Very beautiful. Ye yata mang prapadyante tangs tataiva bhajami aham. Krishna says in Gita that I reciprocate. The way you approach me, I reciprocate with you. For the devotees, he's like this. For the non-devotees, he has a different aspect. We'll discuss that a little later. Sri Mushnam Andavan explains this in reference to the potencies of the Lord that are enjoyed by the devotee as the potencies which are inherent in him, they proceed forward, they blossom forth toward the devotees as needed for protecting them. Parasya shakti vividhaiva shruyate svabhavaki jnana balakriya cha in the Shvetashvarata Upanishad, is stated that the Supreme has various potencies which are described or heard in various ways. Uh, prominent potencies are his knowledge potencies. They're, they're natural to him. It's not that he has to do anything to get them. He has the knowledge potency, the strength potency, the activity potency, and Srimad Sri Mushnam Andavan explains that all these potencies, they can be understood as that which runs on the, I'm, I'm extrapolating a little bit here, that these potencies are those by which he manifests, controls, maintains the universe, but particularly, the devotees see that these potencies, they act for protecting the devotees, for nourishing the devotees. <clears throat> his flower-like tenderness for his devotees illustrates the very what shall we say, raison d'etre the, the, of his appearing in this world, the avatar prayojanam in the technical term, that is the topic of Parashra Bhatta's unpacking explanation of this whole long series of names in the final century of the Vishnu Sahasranam. 
Prashabhata sees on one side the interaction of the Supreme Lord with his devotees, all the things that he does for them, and his flower-like tenderness toward the devotees. For the devotees to have his soft lotus feet resting on their head is their ultimate ambition, their ultimate desire, like having a soft flower, more soft than we can imagine, just beautiful soft flower, like, like a rose, a rose petal, so soft and pleasing to touch. Uh, diaphanous, there's a word used in English relating to cloth, which is very soft and silky and pleasing to the touch. So Bhagavan's entire divine body is just like that, just as flowers are, and especially the feet uh, are said to be very soft. Generally, we think that on the underside of feet, especially if you go walking around barefoot all the time, it becomes very hard as a there's a, a coating of thick skin to protect the, the, the foot, the rest of the foot. But it's said about the Supreme Lord, the, the Sri Vaishnavas, they describe, that the two main consorts of Vishnu, Mahalakshmi and Bhumi Devi, that Sri and Bhu, we see in all the Sri Vaishnava temples, the smaller deities are there of Vishnu with Sri on one side and Bhu on the other. Uh, but they're not always standing by him. They're also eternally massaging his divine lotus feet with their very, very soft, tender, pleasing fingertips. But his feet are so soft and tender that they find it, at least the, the devotees are afraid, that their the feet will become hurt by the touch of their fingers, even though their fingers are so soft. Very famously, in the Bhagavatam, a famous verse which comes right after the Gopi Gita, or, or the, the end, at the end of the Gopi Gita, the Gopis' uh, prayers to Krishna. Yate sujata charanam Bhita shanai priyata dhima hi karka seshu. Tain arta vim arta si tadvyatate na king svit. Kurpadi bhe brahmati dhir bhavad ayusham naha. O dearly beloved, they pray to Krishna, your lotus feet are so soft that we place them very gently on our breasts breasts of the gopis are soft, fearing that your feet will be hurt. Our life rests in you and you alone. Therefore, our minds become filled with anxiety when we think that you walk on the pathway and that your tender feet might be wounded by little tiny pieces of gravel as you roam about on the forest path, because Krishna goes barefoot, even though he has such soft feet, he goes barefoot. When he was first taking out the calves, his mother wanted to give him some shoes to wear, but he said, well, okay, you give me shoes, but you have to give to all my calves also. So he went barefoot, and therefore, throughout Vrindavan, is seen the impression of his lotus feet with all the particular signs of Vishnu on his feet, particularly of Krishna. Taking this Pushpahasa, uh, the explanation of it further, just as flowers blossom on seeing the sun. When the sun comes up, there are certain flowers that open up 
in the sun. So in the same way, Bhagavan becomes delighted when he sees his devotees. A very famous incident described in Brihad Bhagavatamrita when Gopu Kumar goes back to Godhead and Krishna is so happy to see him. Let us give pleasure to Krishna by becoming eligible to enter his eternal abode for service to him. So he becomes delighted when he sees his devotees, just like a flower blossoming, blossoming on seeing the sun. And the devotees, they become delighted. The flower-like devotees become delighted by seeing the flower-like beautiful face of Krishna. Uh, referring to Tiramangai Alva's description from the Divya Prabandhams, his feet are like soft lotus flowers, his hands are soft like lotus flowers, which we can feel as he picks us up when we fall down at his feet and he embraces us with great love and the divine beauty of his, the word used is tirumuri, which refers to the topmost portion of the head, the top of the head with the crown there. Uh, so this, he embraces us and then the, the, his head and the crown on his head and we see his beautiful divine ornaments that will remain in our thoughts forever. And uh, Tirumangai Alva goes on to say that we pray for the blessings of she, Lakshmi Devi, with beautiful broad eyes, who is seated on the lotus flower, on the flower, on his broad chest. So we pray to her who is united with him forever that we also become united with him forever. He's waiting for us. The Supreme Lord is waiting for us in his divine abode, which is itself a place full of fragrant flowers dripping with sweet nectar. Oh, I told you it was a sweet name. Another from uh, Narmalvar's Turu Vayamoli where he describes Bhagavan's eyes, feet, hands, every limb of his body uh, f as being like tender, fragrant, and beautiful lotus flowers. But actually, he says, it's a very poor comparison since they have nowhere near the beauty compared to the beauty of the Supreme Lord. Similarly, in Sanatana Goswami's Brihad Vaishnav Toshani on Bhagavatam, Canto 10, Chapter 8, Text 22, Sanatana Goswami says, when describing the feet of Krishna and Balaram, in this case, he doesn't compare them to lotuses. Usually, we, we, when we're talking about the lotus feet of Krishna and Balaram, we say Charanaravinda, or Padmapad, something which compares them to lotuses. But in this case, Sanatana Goswami says that Shukadev doesn't do that in this case because Shukadev realized that lotuses are a very poor comparison to their feet. When their feet are compared to lotuses in other places, it should be understood that these words are the realizations of others. But he says that Shukadev at this point thought, compare them to a lotus? Nah, that's not good enough. Mukunda, this name comes to mind. The, one of the meanings of Mukunda is that he whose face, Mukha, is as beautiful as the Kunda flower. There are many quotes about the beautiful face of Krishna, his beautiful smile, uh, comparing to flowers, uh, this, this I'm going to give from Bhagavatam, Canto 3, Chapter 28, Text 33, Purport. 
The exceptional beauty of the laughter of Lord Vishnu is that when he smiles, his small teeth, which resemble the buds of jasmine flowers, at once become reddish, reflecting his rosy lips. So there we have Pushpahasa. His, his smile and his laughter uh, reveal his small teeth, which resemble the buds of jasmine flowers. So flower smile. And Prabhupada goes on to state that if the yogi is able to place the beautiful face of the Lord in the core of his heart, he, the yogi, will be completely satisfied. In the Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 8, Text 44, Sutta Goswami describes how Krishna responded to the prayers of Queen Kunti. The Lord, thus hearing the prayers of Kunti Devi, composed in choice words for his glorification, mildly smiled. That smile was as enchanting as his mystic power. More about Krishna's smile. The Bhagavatam, Canto 1, sorry, Canto 2, Chapter 1, Text 31, uh, refers to the most alluring, illusory material energy as the smile of the Lord's universal form. Continuing Prabhupada's description, paraphrasing. In the spiritual world, Krishna's smile is the most attractive spiritual energy. When pervertedly reflected in this world, it manifests as the material energy, which keeps the living entities who are trying to make themselves into God and Lord of material nature, keeps them in delusion. Yaya samo hito jiva. Atmanam Trigunatmakam. And he binds them in this world with the shackles of lust and material desire. But when the living entity revives his natural constitutional service spirit to Krishna, the word Mayaya, which has been referred to, and Prabhupada uh, unpacks it as the most alluring, illusory material energy. Uh, <coughs> Maya, in the verse quoted above, it may refer to his mystic power that bewills the non-devotee, but here, affection. That here, Maya, affection. Srila Prabhupada explains that Krishna smiles with affection for his devotees as a mother smiles with affection for her baby. And Krishna's smile makes the devotees very pleased, very satisfied. Bhagavatam, Canto 3, Chapter 28, Text 32, Lord Kapila says, Hasang harer avanata kila loka tivra shokashu sagara vishoshanam atyudaram. A yogi should meditate on the most benevolent smile of Lord Sri Hari, Krishna, a smile which for all those who bow to him dries up the ocean of tears caused by intense grief. I remember first time reading this. I thought, oh, that really? Oh, that's, that's very beautiful. Very beautiful description. And a very um, apt also for us in this material world because this the material world described as an ocean of tears caused by intense grief. Oh, that really, really explains the material world. But that ocean of tears is dried up by Krishna's smile, the most benevolent smile of Krishna. We're in the ocean of tears caused by intense grief. In everyone's life, there are so many difficulties, ups and downs, and uncertainties, and anxieties, and we, it can really give us a lot of distress and make us feel 
without any shelter, hopeless, pessimistic. We may just feel like we're on our own in the whole big, bad, cold universe. But we can open the Bhagavatam and look at the smiling face of the Lord where we'll get hope. His smile never fades away. See the deity of Krishna? Radha Shama Sundara in Vrindavan, Gokula Ananda in London, so many. Govinda in New York, he's always smiling. His smile never fades away. We should meditate on that and become free from the grief, which is the situation of our situation in this material existence. Srila Prabhupada writes in his purport to Bhagavatam, Canto 3, Chapter 8, Text 27, Devotees do not ask anything from the Lord in exchange for their service. Even the most desirable liberation is refused by devotees, although offered by the Lord. Thus the Lord becomes a kind of debtor to the devotees, and he can only try to repay the devotee's service with his ever-enchanting smile. The devotees are ever satisfied by the smiling face of the Lord, and they become enlivened. So if we feel dissatisfaction in our hearts, just look at the smiling face of the Lord and become enlivened. Srila Prabhupada continues, and by seeing the devotees so enlivened, the Lord himself is further satisfied. He smiles more. So there is continuous transcendental competition between the Lord and his devotees by such reciprocation of service and acknowledgement. Then a very beautiful section of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teachings to Sanatana Goswami. Krishnanga madhur jasindu, sumadhur mukha indu, ati madhur smita sukhirane. The transcendental form of Lord Sri Krishna is compared to an ocean of sweetness. A particularly extraordinary vision is the moon above that ocean, Sri Krishna's face, and an even more extraordinary vision is his smile which is sweeter than sweet and is like shining beams of moonlight. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu continued, Madhurang Madhurang Vapur Asya Vibhur Madhurang Madhurang Vadanang Madhuram Madhugandhi Mridusmita Metadaho Madhurang 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 Madhuram O my Lord, the transcendental body of Krishna is very sweet and his face is even sweeter than his body. But his soft smile, Pushpahasa, which has the fragrance of honey, is sweeter still. Krishnanga la bonnapur madhur hoite shumadhur tate je mukhashudhakar Madhur hoite shumadhur, taha hoite shumadhur, tarje shmita jochna bha. Krishna's body is a city of attractive features and it is sweeter than sweet. See, you're just trying to use some words to describe it. His face, which is like the moon, is sweeter still and the supremely sweet, gentle smile on that moonlike face is like rays of moonshine. So here we go. It's the discussion of Krishna's sweetness. And again and again saying that the most sweet thing about Krishna is his smile. Madhur hoite shu madhur, taha hoite shu madhur, taha hoite oti shu madhur. Apanar ekone, bape shab tribubone, Dashadik Bapi Jarpur. The beauty of Krishna's smile is the sweetest feature of all. His smile is like a full moon 
that spreads its rays throughout the three worlds, Golok Vrindavan, the spiritual sky of the Vaikuntas, and Devi Dham, the material world. Thus, Krishna's shining beauty spreads in all ten directions. Smita Kiran Shukapure, Poise Adhur Modhure, She Modhu Matai Tribubane, Bongshi Chidra Akashe, Targun Shogde Poise, Dhani Rupe Paya Parunaame. His, sw- his slight smiling and fragrant illumination are compared to camphor, which is a bit different from pushpahasa. So it's a different analogy, but anyway. His sl- slight smiling and fragrant illumination are compared to camphor, which enters the sweetness of his lips. That sweetness is transformed and enters into space as vibrations from the holes of his flute. So this is very sweet, very beautiful, very pleasing to hear. Uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu elaborating on descriptions from the 10th canto of Bhagavatam, which is the sweet, according to Padma Purana, the 10th canto of Bhagavatam should be seen as the sweet and enchanting smile of Krishna which more than anything delights the hearts of his devotees. But for us, down here in this material world, struggling to understand the basic messages of Bhagavad Gita, uh, let alone the 10th canto of Bhagavatam, there's another gentle smile, Pushpahasa, which we find in the beginning of Bhagavad Gita. Actually, before Krishna really opened up and started his Bhagavad Gita, his his disquisition to Arjuna. Tamovacha hushi kesha prahasan eva bharata sena yor ubhayor madhe vishidantam idam vachaha. Then Krishna saw Arjuna. Lamenting in the midst of the two armies, Krishna and Arjuna, Arjuna is lamenting, but Krishna smiling. Arjuna is collapsing and Krishna is composed and smiling. This is the most important smile ever manifest in the whole of material existence. It saved Arjuna, not only Arjuna, but an unlimited number of devotees who by Krishna's, by his smile, showing that he's maintaining his composure, that Arjuna is down and out, but Krishna by his smile indicates that you may be down and out, but I am a tutor, and I'm always happy. I'm not going to collapse like you. I'm not going to em- empathically lament with you, but I know what you need, Arjuna, to become happy. So this is the mercy of Krishna. He remains very happy. When we are down and out, which is all the time, we are suffering in this material world. We can look at him. He's happy. And if we listen to his instructions and take them into our hearts, as did Arjuna, then we also become happy by his grace. So this is Pushpahasa, his smile. And then from there, he smiles as Arjuna is Vishidantam idang vachaha. To the lamenting Arjuna, he spoke thus. And what did he say? And then he starts his instructions about the eternality of the jiva compared to the 
temporality of the body, and on and on and on. Another way to look at this name, Pushpahasa, is given by Radha Krishna Shastri, that Bhagavan makes devotees blossom like a flower. They become delighted simply thinking about him and they blossom in delight at his thought. And he also blossoms in their heart and gives a sweet fragrance to everything they think about, everything they do and say. Therefore, he's Pushpahasa. Satyadeva Varshishta explains the name as that the one who is always of a very pleasing disposition, who is beyond any sorrow, untainted by any defects, devoid of any mundane lust, desire, greed, any such thing. Just as it is, Satyadeva Varshishta explains, just as it is the dharma or the very nature of a flower to blossom beautifully, so it is also the nature of Bhagavan to have a sweet and smiling countenance. So he gives two explanations of the meaning. Uh, Shankaracharya explains the name as referring to Bhagavan blossoming, expanding into the form of the universe, just as the buds of a flower. You just see some little some little bud and then in the course of time it opens up and becomes so beautiful and fragrant. So in the same way Shankara says, he, Bhagavan, has blossomed in the form of the universe. <clears throat> uh, and he remains as a fresh, soft flower. He's always naturally very fresh, and soft, and fragrant, and pleasing. But he's not soft to all, nor all the time. Mahanu bhave chite shobhava ehoi pushpa shama komal kotin bhajramai. This, that's from Chaitanya Charitamrita. This is the nature of the mind of an uncommon personality, great personality. Sometimes his mind is soft like a flower, Sometimes, as hard as a thunderbolt. Vajrad api katorani mriduni kusamadapi loko taranam chaitangsi konu vigyatam ishvaraha. The hearts of those above common behavior are sometimes harder than a thunderbolt and sometimes softer than a flower. How can one accommodate such contradictions? in great personalities. Baladev Vidya Bhushan, explaining this series of names in terms of the pastimes of Krishna in Vrindavan, and especially this section within a section, uh, Krishna enjoying the Rasalila with his most dear gopis. Uh, Baladev Vidya Bhushan explains Pushpa Hasa, which means that he jokes Hasa with the gopis in a manner that is suitable for amorous pastimes, which are compared to a flower, pushpa. And in this regard, Baladev Vidya Bhushan quotes from the uh, Rasa Panchadhyaya, the, the five chapters of the Bhagavatam describing the Rasa Lila from Bhagavatam, Canto 10, chapter 29, text 43, uh, Shukdev says, Udara hasa dvija kunda diti tir viaro chatainanka evorubhir vritaha. Krishna was shining surrounded by the gopis just like the moon surrounded by the stars, and the brightness of his jasmine like teeth was visible in his broad smiles. Vanchakalpa turu bhyas chakripa sindhu bhyavichapati dhanam 